Hello and welcome to episode 11 of my Battle Games of Middle Earth Terrain Builds. This week I'm going to be doing a Hilltop Ruin from magazine number 12. Yes, number 12. Which is going to be good fun to build. Now I normally do two builds and I'm going to do two builds again this video I think. But as I stand here right now about to crack into this I really don't know what my second one's going to be, so I'm hoping that inspiration strikes me as I'm building through the official one. If it doesn't, then I just won't do it. I'm not going to delay the video, but I really hope that I can give you something a little more interesting or well, a little more varied over and above what is in the magazine. I will now point the camera down and we will start going through the steps. Okay, so here we are. You can see a hilltop ruin. The ancient landscape of Middle Earth is dotted with ruins and watchtowers from the Second Age. Here we show you how to make a simple but effective hilltop ruin to represent an imposing ancient landmark. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So it's straightforward techniques needed to make a hilltop ruin. Although these ruins are used to represent Weathertop in the Battle Games game, they can also be used to represent any ruined watchtower or crumbling ancient structures in your games. Middle Earth is a vast place and many of these weather-worn towers are dotted about the landscape, serving as a grim reminder of the war-torn Second Age. The Hilltop Ruin draws on all the basic techniques you have learned in previous packs and also allows you to experiment by adding realistic finishing touches to your terrain piece. So it sounds pretty cool and I'm rather excited to get stuck in. Let's have a look at what you'll need. You'll need corrugated packing card, standard, thin cardboard, standard, ready mixed or powdered plaster filler, yep, doweling or tube. Now, I have been delayed starting this, I was hoping to start this a week ago, as I was waiting for my balsa doweling to turn up. Now, living in Bulgaria, dowel is actually very, very hard to get hold of. They, they don't really sell it, and particularly with COVID going around and not really been able to explore and go to other towns and cities, I'm very limited in my supply. So I had to order this online and wait for a while, but it did arrive and it's really good, so that's good. Uh, a junior hacksaw, paint, super glue, PVA, paintbrush, sprue rubble, modeling sand, static grass, craft knife, cutting mat, steel rule, scissors, and masking tape. So it's a pretty standard thing. Let's go to the first step, which we're going to skip because frankly, I'm not making another hill. Uh, if you want to see that, there's one in this playlist that you can see me making the hill. You can make use of the hill that you made in the previous pack, it says. So step two, the bases. The columns that form your ruins can be mounted on individual bases so that you can move them around in any formation you require, which is a really cracking idea, really. The bases are made in the usual way from thin cardboard. We used circular bases of about five centimeters or two inches in diameter. But again, the exact measurements are not crucial. Make at least five bases like this before moving on to making the columns in step three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gather together my materials and then I'll be back to make some bases. I've just gone and collected some card and I've also found the template that I'm gonna to use to uh, draw around and cut out. The instructions say about two inches in diameter, but I want to make it a little bit bigger, just so it's a little bit more stable. And so I've gone away and I've found this Nescafe uh, top, which is about seven centimeters, which is just a couple of centimeters larger than they suggest. So it's not much, much bigger, but it is a little bit bigger. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw around that and we need to make five of these. So I'm going to draw around that five times onto this card. Now this is actually from a packet of pedigree chum food and it really is good solid hard card which is what we need. It's not thick but it's, uh, it's got a good, good strength to it, it feels like it anyway. So I will get these all now cut out and I'll be back very shortly. After that's done, what I will say is I'm going to use nail scissors for cutting out the circles because I've found that nail scissors are sharp and small and they're more agile than big scissors. So if you're looking at using scissors to cut things out, then it's always a good idea to have a pack of nail scissors or have a, have a nail scissors to hand for this kind of a, of a job. Um, as you can see, not very well because it's a bit washed out but they're very agile cutting through the card and allow you to follow that line nice and easily so that you're getting a good circle. So I'm going to get the rest of these cut out uh, and I'll be back for step three very shortly. 
They're cut now. I've got five circles, as you can see. So we're now going to move on to step three, which is the columns. The columns are cylindrical struts measuring six centimeters to eight centimeters long and about 20 millimeters or one inch in diameter. Okay, you will need to make five columns, one per base. Don't worry too much about the exact width as long as they're all about the same length. There are a number of materials you can use to make the columns, such as wooden doweling, either hardwood from DIY stores or balsa wood from hobby stores. As I've already said, I went for balsa wood, as you can see here. Or even cardboard tubes that some stores, uh, confe confectioneries packaged in. Uh, you can also use uh, plumbing or uh, plumbing pipes, whatever. Anyway, I'm going to use doweling uh, made from balsa because it's much easier to work with and also I'm trying to get used to dow uh, to balsa because I have had a historical aversion to it and I think that's silly. So what I can do now is I'm going to cut them into this into five um, lengths um, and I'm going to do it at the shorter end of the uh, spectrum that they've suggested six centimeters which is around there. Um, I'm a little bit far offline, so I'll move over. That's a bit easier for you to see. So I'm going to do it at about six centimeters. Um, and the good thing with the balsa is, is I don't need to get the junior hacksaw. I can actually literally cut it, as you can see, gently cut it with a rocky motion with my um, with my knife, which makes it a bit easier to do, especially as it's night time and I don't really want to have to go down to the workshop. So I will now get these cut, and I'll be back when I'm gluing them, because that's the second part of step three. So I'll get these cut, I'll be back very shortly. Okay, I've got five dowels cut, all to about five, uh, six centimeters long. The next step is once selected cutting material, as I've just done, if you're using wood for your columns, then you can give the impression of individual stone blocks by cutting narrow grooves all around them with the saw. So what I'm gonna do is at about every two centimeters, I'm just going to cut a narrow groove like it suggests, all the way around and I'll do that on this one block and then glue it in place and then I'll do the do it for the others as well but there's no point in you seeing me do the same thing over and over again so we're going to cut in this so that's going to be looking to be a little bit wider I could actually here I has here's another idea I have my um, bradles so I reckon I could make use of my bradles to do this and make it a little wider there we are, so just scoring it in with the bradle. That's a better way of doing it. Gives it a bit more of an indentation. There we are, and so what we'll do is we'll go to the next two centimeter here. Um, move it so that you can see a bit better. And we'll score that in. Now the good thing with this is, it's supposed to be damaged. So these little bits of damage which is going on around the edges are actually going to be in context. Okay, so there we are, we've made ourselves a little column. And what it says is, glue the column to the base with super glue <laughs> and allow it time to dry. Super glue, huh? Okay. We'll follow their instructions. I would always normally use PVA for wood to cardboard. But the thing with, with wood is, with PVA, is it does take a little bit of time to dry. Whereas super glue is almost instant, and that is the benefit. So there we are, we have some super glue, and we'll stick it on. Done. All right, I'll get the other five going, and I'll be back with the next step shortly. Okay, now step four the arches. The arches are made from corrugated packing card, as you can see in front of me here. Mark out a straight section at least as high as your columns and about 25 millimeters or an inch wide. From the top of this section, extend a rough curve, trying to keep the lines parallel so that you end up with a shape like the one shown on the right. <clears throat> okay, the arch will need to butt closely against the columns to cut away a recess that the column will fit slugly into. Mark out a rectangle into the outside edge of the arch as shown. It should be as high as your column, but no more than half as wide. Okay, so I would say that you don't have to do them all the same and you can put um, ledges or whatever. So I have already started on this because I just got stuck in and forgot to turn the camera on. So apologies. So I will now zoom the camera in a little bit over here and you can see what I'm doing. So I've marked out a square which is six centimeters high, which is the height of my columns. And then I've marked out here on this side, the, the cross hatchings, that is where I'm going to remove it for so the column can butt up against it. 
So what I'm now going to do is attempt to draw a curve. Um, and my idea is, my plan for this is, is for this first one to be almost like a template. So I'm going to draw a full curve, and then the other ones uh, that I do, the other um, arches that I do, will potentially be subsets of that curve, so they'll be cut down um, a little further. So this is two centimeters, uh, two and a half centimeters wide, which is the width of my uh, uh, width of my column as well as it happens. Um, so we're going to go from the centre, which is where that is. Um, no, we're going to go right from the end, right from the edge, and we're going to draw an archway, which is going to go up a bit and then curve round. I am no artist. Just give it a go. Okay. And I'm going to mark two centimetres, two and a half centimetres below that roughly. So I know roughly where I'm aiming for. And we're going to give it a go. Trying to keep them parallel. Huh. Easier said than done. However, I think that might have worked. I don't know how much you can really see. Apologies. You'll see more when I've cut it out. But I've basically drawn a curve here, which I will now cut out. And that is going to be the large extent of my arch. Uh, what, I will, what I'll do now is cut this out and then transfer it over and cut lots of different templates out. Um, because I've got five arches, each of these arches is doubled. So I'm going to cut this out. So I'll have, I have 10 arches, each of them in pairs. So five pairs of arches. That was hard for me to say. I probably could have explained that more easily. However, I will get that done and I'll be back when I've finished and I'll show what it looks like. Okay, quick in progress here just to show how I've done this. So I've taken my template, which I cut out using my Stanley knife and I've transferred nine more that are exactly the same and I'm gonna cut them all out how they are. What I'll then do is come back and show you how I'm going to customize each one. But I thought I'd also just quickly show you how I'm going about doing the cutting because that's actually a little bit interesting when you're working with corrugated cards. So first of all, we will cut down and separate what we want away. So we're not dealing with too big a section of card because unwieldy card is hard to work with. So we'll get rid of that. That could be used for a different project. Okay, so now we have nine shapes that we want to cut out. What I suggest that you do is that you don't try to cut too close uh, and do it too accurately. What you do is you shave off areas so that you reduce the amount that you need to cut so that you're not having to be totally accurate again when you have an unwieldy bit of cardboard. So something like that. Okay. And then once you've separated one shape out and I'll do the rest off camera again you can see it's good because it doesn't matter that this is a bit rough once you've separated that shape out what we're going to do is we're going to start cutting out each of these and the tip here I would say you do is do as with everything don't try and force it through straight away do very gentle cuts so that you're not compressing the cardboard because otherwise you'll start pressing the cardboard down and you'll start impacting the corrugated structure because while it is strong it's not that strong and when you've got pressure from a, a thin blade that isn't necessarily going to cut it by being pressed on it it will just push it down so lots and lots of thin cuts and cut them in sections in small sections so don't try and do too much at once and what you'll find is if you follow those simple instructions that pretty quickly you will be able to cut these shapes out and you'll end up with a really nice clean cut and it will also be have retained its structure and its shape so i will carry on with this and we'll be back there we are you can see how neat and tidy that cut is I'll carry on with this and I'll be back when I've cut them all out and I'm about to customise them. Okay, as you can see, I now have, after a fair bit of time actually, it's quite a uh, tedious task cutting these out after last week's being so easy, this week's a bit more tedious. Uh, but yet I've got five of these arches. So this is the first one which I'm going to leave how it is. And then I've got 
four others that I'm going to do slightly different things. As you can see, I've left the bases a little bit kind of random so that I can cut them out differently. So I will, first of all, cut this one to be a lot shorter. So this one is going to lose quite a lot of the arch. And what I'm actually going to do is keep the arch that I cut away so I can maybe use it on more scatter terrain because one of the suggestions that they make in the magazine is alternative approach, fallen columns and linking walls. I could even do it so I have some scattered terrain that is actually the fallen parts of the arches that can go near them. Or indeed, I could even put them down on the base of the arch as well. So I'll keep them to one side. So having done that, simple as this, I can score out where to cut and then cut it out. So I'm not going to do all of these on camera because it will be very tedious. Again, it's only going to be repeating this pattern, working out where I want to reduce the size and then making sure that I cut both arches the same, which is harder than it looks, but is certainly okay if you take your time and you're not rushing. There we are. So that's going to be another set of arches. Now what am I going to do on the base of this one? On the base of this one I think I'm going to just have one uh, of the little outcroppings. So I will cut there and I will cut down like so. And I'll do the same with the other one. I'm going to do, carry out this process for all of the other um, arches and then I'll be back when I'm beginning to glue them together. And I want to get that done this evening and it's already late, so I'm gonna be rushing through this off camera. So hopefully I will see you and it will still be this evening when I next shoot a clip. Well, hey, I did it. So I've got five different arches now and now the task is to glue them together. And I'll do this simply using PVA glue. So we will apply some glue to one side, spread it around a bit, like so. Apply the other side on top, and then grab hold of my, of my clamps and clamp it in place. And I will leave that overnight to dry, and I'll come back to this again tomorrow to do the next step. So I will clamp each of these like so and then I'm going to go to bed myself. So there we are, we've made it to pretty much the end of step four, which is pretty cool in one evening. I uh, will see you again in the next clip. Next up we've got step five, which is pretty standard again for the Battle Games of Middle Earth builds. Fill in the gaps. Before sticking your arches to their bases, you will need to fill in all the gaps in the corrugated card. Do this by wrapping strips of masking tape around it, just as you have in previous modeling workshops. Once this is done, use PVA glue to stick the arches to the bases, making sure that the recesses of the arches, that's these little bits here, fit snugly against the columns. So. I have a couple of rolls of the uh, masking tape here and so I'm going to get stuck in and while I'm watching Wargaming World, uh, thank you Gregory for providing me with entertainment for this evening, I will get stuck into wrapping this around like so and it will take me a little while. This whole build is taking longer than, than normal and I still haven't actually come up with a a good idea for my more advanced build. I've had some ideas, but I've discarded them all. So I'm gonna get stuck into that, wrapping around the uh, masking tape, and I'll be back once I've finished and once they're stuck down and onto the next step, which is texture and detail. There's a, it's pretty obvious, PVA, stick it on, done. Let me show you actually. They will stick on like so. Okay, onwards. Okay, so I've done a lot of thinking and I've come up with my idea for the more advanced build for this project. So I had a few ideas and the one I've settled on is I'm going to build the rest of the watchtower. The instructions for the official build, which you can see the current state of here, are to make five of these, which means that I'm going to be arranging these in the pentagon and I will be creating a circular 
area, a circular cutout of this cardboard, and making it so that I can set these columns, these arches, into indentations. So this will be cut out and I'll be doing some um, XPS underneath it and then some more columns uh, which I'm going to make use of some plumbing pipe because that was another suggestion from this week's uh, magazine and so I'm going to make use of that and show you how to use plumbing pipe and then if you don't have access to balsa or wood for this part of the build then you'll be able to see how I'm going to use plumbing pipe and make it look nice and then I'll do a corresponding base and what will happen is these will all be able to be removed obviously this top section will have its pillars down below which will be able to be removed and then there'll be a base section into which those pillars will sit so that when it's done you'll have the base you'll have this floor and then you'll have these arches on top and there will be a stairway coming up from the lower level up in the center of this cardboard which will also sit on XPS it's not going to be totally cardboard um, and yeah so that's the idea anyway let's see how well I do I'm going to get stuck into that as much as I can and uh, hopefully this isn't going to make the builder a huge rush but hey it's going to look great and that is all that matters. The first challenge is to actually draw a pentagon <clears throat> so there are ways of doing this with maths and measurements but I'm going to eyeball it because that's how I work and also I'm pretty happy with how that looks so I don't really want to disturb it it's actually fallen out quite nicely it's going to be quite a large terrain piece but then <clears throat> isn't everything that I do quite a large terrain piece so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw around each of these and I have a tool which I'm going to use to cut a perfect circle hopefully which I'll show you in a second. So first of all, I'm gonna draw around each of these where they sit, because that's roughly where I want it to be. And then move them out of the way as I go so that they don't get in the way. So I'll do that. And then I'll come back in a second and show you the next step. It's quite a relief to actually be cracking on with this part of the build. I'd be really sad if I'd not done one. With those circles now drawn out, I can now trim down this large chunk of cardboard, not to the shape that it will be eventually, but just so that it's slightly less unwieldy. So let's get that done. Okay, now that we have a useful size of cardboard that is going to be easier for us to actually manipulate and move around, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the centers of each of these circles. And to do that, I have the Nescafe coffee lid pot that I used as a template for the bases. And I'm going to position it very carefully so that I can find the center. And using a hole, the um, same drill that I used to drill the hole, I'm just going to push that through and that now has marked where the center of that circle is. So I'm gonna get stuck into doing the rest of them and then I'll be back with the next step. Okay, so I've found the centers of each of these circles. And what I'm now gonna do is cut them out. Now, I bought a little while ago this tile cutting implement, that's actually what it is, which is designed to uh, allow you to cut circles in tiles, obviously. So it's got a sharp edge and it's got a center point. And what I'm going to be attempting to do, and I'm going to have to sit this on something and, and this might not work perfectly the first time, I've not tried this yet, so I'll give it a go, is I'm going to expand the size of this so that it's the right uh, distance away from the centre. And then by hand, not in a drill, I'm going to use it to cut through the cardboard. And I'm going to see if it works. Hopefully it will. I've not tried it before. So I've got a screwdriver. And what we're going to do is loosen this little screw here, because that's how it works. There we are. And then we can move that center, as you see, and we, until we get it to where we want. Now, what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to make it slightly wider than what I've drawn because that will make it easier for me to drop these other arch pieces in and out of this terrain. So once we've got that to roughly the right area, okay, we can now see that that, when it's drawn in, is going to draw a nice circle. So let's see if it works. It seems to. I might need to have something a little tighter to hold that with. So, give me one minute and I'll be back. After a little bit of experimentation, I think I can do it just with my hands. 
It's just going to take a little bit of time. And it might not be as accurate as I was hoping. But I'm going to get keep on with this. And see what I can do. I'll come back in a little bit when I've had a bit more of a play. And I'm doing a bit less live experimentation. So um, yeah, I'll be back when I've worked out exactly how this is going to work. That worked okay. It does need some more experimentation, I think, to get it absolutely nailed right. However, you can see that the circles are pretty clean and they are definitely big enough for me to drop these in and we'll be able to cope with there being a little bit of like overspill from any terraining or scenicing that I do, so I'm happy with that. So the next thing for me to do is going to be to draw around this so that I actually get the extent of the floor. Now these are going to be wanting to be not too close because I don't want it to be too weak but also not too far because I don't want it to be too huge. So my thinking is is that I will roughly draw around the outsides of the circles that I've cut which are actually slightly off centre. That is one of the issues with my bad use of that tool. I'll get better at it. So if I draw straight lines from each apex as such, then we can get our pentagram. And then what I can do is I can draw a little distance away from that, maybe the width of a ruler or something like that, and then cut that out. So I'll get that done. There we are, you see. I'll get that done. And I will come back when I've got to the next, the next step. I had a problem with my microphone, which meant that the audio didn't record very well, so I'm just going to do this as a voiceover. So the next step here is to cut out this pentagon. I'm using my Stanley knife and my safety ruler, as I always do, and I'm just going to score along a couple of times, not pulling too hard and not pressing too hard, and it cuts quite easily when you do that. So I will pop some music on and I will return with the voiceover very shortly. With that cut out successfully, next step is for access. So this is gonna be the first floor of this watchtower and there's gonna be a story below it. So what I'm gonna do is put in place the arches that were the uh, built before. Um, and then I'm gonna measure so that I can find the center of one side opposite that arch there and cut out a shape so that that will be the access through which some stairs or a ladder will go. So once again, I'll pop some music on and you can watch as I do this. is done it's six centimeters wide and ten centimeters long and that is going to be absolutely sufficient to provide access between the two floors now I'm going to transfer this shape to the XPS that you can see here and cut that out so simple technique I will mark each of the corners with um, I think I use at the first stage a pencil but I do actually end up going to using a sharpie which is a much better idea because you get you can see it better then draw the lines between each of those points and then cut them out using my usual technique which is the Stanley knife and the safety ruler so I will put some music on and you can watch as I do this With everything cut out now, as you can see, including the space for the uh, ladder and also with the 
different spaces for the arches nicely in place. I'm now going to glue the cardboard on top of the XPS. To do this I'm going to use PVA glue, smear it around and then weight it down. So I'll pop some music on and you can watch that. So as you can see, this has been weighted down with these uh, exercise weights. I do actually have a machine to use them on, but they're so useful hobbying <laughs> that this is all they get used for at the moment. Um, and that's, uh, that's dried very nicely underneath those weights. So I'm still working towards this odd shaped pentagon at this stage, though in the next clip you'll see that that's not going to last for very much longer. But it has glued well and it's proven the point of what I'm trying to achieve. So it wasn't a total waste and hopefully having watched this isn't a total waste of your time. So the idea is, is that this will be the top where the arches are and then underneath uh, will be another of the same size pentagon which will contain uh, will have columns going up and we'll, that will then sit on top as you're seeing there and then there will be the steps going up from below so that's what I'm explaining my microphone was still having problems at this stage and therefore that audio got lost unfortunately but you haven't missed much because I've pretty much remembered everything that I've said so I will now wrap this up and I will go back to real-time vocals which are much better I think for me and hopefully that has worked well for you I've thought about this over and over again now what I did before which you might or might not see, I haven't decided yet whether I'll keep all the footage in, was me making this, which is not an equal pentagon. I just kind of guessed. And the more I looked at it, the unhappy I got, which is how it is when you're trying to cut corners. So what I've decided to do is attempt <laughs> to do an accurate pentagon. Now there's all sorts of methods online that you can follow that involve using uh, protractors and all sorts of things and um, compasses and everything. Uh, and it's like you know, PhD in maths and frankly I'm a little, my, my head is, no, is, is not going to be able to cope with that. So I'm doing the simple method, which is using the protractor and the maths are that each of the angles is 72 degrees. So if we start off with our baseline and we go 72 degrees from the center. So I've just drawn this circle using the protractor. Um, so if we, sorry, the compass, not the protractor, this is the protractor. So if we go from naught to 72 degrees, Okay, and draw a line from the center through that mark. Then that will give us where on the circle we should draw. Okay, so that's our line there. So if we draw that line now, and if we go 72 degrees from that one, then we should get our next mark and so and so forth. So I'm hoping that this is going to work because, yeah, should do. Because I'm a little bit behind because of this mistake, which isn't really ideal. But the lesson to learn, which is why I'm including all this, is don't cut corners because you'll stare at it for hours after you've built it and you'll be like, why did I not just do it right? And so I decided to avoid that irritation and do it much more right than I was doing it. Now this method is certainly not the uh, most accurate method you'll find. Doing it with all sorts of angles and maths and stuff is far more accurate. But it will certainly be more accurate than my guesswork was previously. So anyway, I'm going to finish doing this uh, and then work out exactly where I want to, um, to cut. Cut out my uh, pentagon uh, and do the rest of the presses that you've already seen. So transfer it onto the foam, onto the, um, onto the uh, and this will be my template. So transfer it onto the, um, 
foam and stick it down and what have you and I'll come back when I've got to the same stage as I was before, before I made the mistake. Success. As you can see, I made a template using the circle technique, measured out 72 degrees, found the, found the points and then measured out another distance at 90 degrees from each line and then extended each point out so that I made it slightly larger because that was the largest circle I could draw with the um, with, with the compass that I own. Using that template I have cut out two pieces of the XPS, blue XPS. This piece is the top piece and on the other side I've done the very thin, I've decided to go away from cardboard on this bit and use the thin foam to, uh, to, to put on top of the blue foam and glued that on with PVA. And I've cut out, as you can see, the five holes to accept the five arches and I think that's going to look very good. So what I'm now about to do is actually in the same way as I've done for this one I'm actually going to trim off the um, texture off this blue foam. It's the only problem really with this blue foam is that it comes with this texture which I'm sure is very good for when you're looking to stick it to walls but it isn't really what you want when you're in the natural world. Uh, as this is. So it doesn't have to be perfect. You can see just how kind of uneven that is. It's supposed to look like a rock and as it's painted up and textured it will look more and more natural uh, as we as, as, as it looks less uh, le le less regular like it does at the moment on this. So the way that I do this is very very careful. I'm not going to do it all on camera because it is a slightly tedious process and also I want to get into a slightly better position than I am now for filming. But you do it in small sections, so you just run your knife very, very gently and peel it off. Then you need to be very careful of where your hand is when you're pulling, and you want to make sure that you're not pulling and having too much resistance, because if you jerk, then you're, that's when you're going to cut yourself, is when you have sudden movements. And as you're getting into the centre, this is also just to show you, and I'm going to stop filming in a second because this is actually harder to do in this angle, is you can just, with these Stanley knives, you can actually bend the knife, bend the blade slightly. Not very much. Squeak, squeak. Doesn't need to bend it very much, but it does allow you to get to areas which you wouldn't otherwise be able to reach flat because flat is possibly, well, it's, but the flat is easier from the edges, but as you get into the center, you're gonna to need to just press down with your finger at the far end and do that. There we are. Right, I'm gonna carry on with doing that off camera and I'll be back for the next step very shortly. Now we're coming to the crossover part where I'm going to start working on both the standard from the magazine build and also my more advanced extension to it. So the first thing that I need to do as I'm working on this is reach and grab my Sharpie. Because what I'm going to be doing now is building the shallow, the narrow wall or the low wall which is going to go around the edge between each of these which will lead from the uprights here come across at an angle and across at an angle uh, and will join up. So when you drop these in, it will have a ruined wall on the base of this that will tie up with a ruined wall that's on the base here. And to make sure that I don't make mistakes, what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to number these off so that I know which of these arches I'm going to put into which hole as I work forwards. And I'm going to remember them on the bottom, so they'll always be visible. So we'll call that one number one. And I'll do a number one here. And we'll number them round from there. So we'll call this one number two. And we'll put a two there. There we are. Number three and number three. And what we'll also need to do is mark on where the wall needs to be so when it's going to actually line up because what you don't want is it looking a bit odd though of course it is ruined so it's not the end of the world if it's not totally square however it would be nice to have it have it correct so what we'll do is we will now get our straight edge I have one right here because everything is always to hand which is the best way and I will draw a line 
and it will be a little rough because it's going to be using the edge of the uh, top foam and making sure that the distance is about the same and we're going to draw that line here and across and onto there and to meet the other base and we'll do that all the way around so let's get that done There we are, now we are able to take these out and put them back in again and know roughly the positioning that we're going to need to do to maintain what we're trying to achieve. So the next step is to actually start looking at these low walls. Now I have all sorts of odds and scraps of um, foam which I, I save because I don't throw very much away and what I'm going to do now is gather that all together and start to build some walls and I will invite you along to that process when I've got all my materials together. I just cut and cleaned the, te the texture off of this blue foam. It's six centimeters high so it matches the height of the little kind of columny thing. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, as an experiment, I'm going to do numbers four and five and just gonna have a play around with it and see how well it works. So the first thing I think I need to do is get a rough distance between the two. So if I hold this above like so I should be able to get in there and mark roughly where that line is and you can see that that is fine. So if we cut that down there that should nicely fit between the two. I say nicely, I might need to shave it a little bit there. I missed the mark, that's why that's bad. There we are. So that fits nicely between the two as you can see. And it will butt up in the middle, so it will butt up between the, the column and the archway. So it's actually going to be quite neat. I'm actually going to put it that way around, I think. Anyway, there we are. So what we're then going to do is I'm going to hold this like this and mark along the bottom where that cut needs to be for the bottom of that base, like so. And then in the same way, I'm going to hold this in place and do the same thing there, like that. Okay, now that's curved, which obviously is going to prove a bit of a challenge, but it should be okay. Again, this is a ruin, so if it's not absolutely right, and it might be even that we don't actually have the wall going the whole way along. Possibly for this one I will, as it's my experiment. So we will now cut that straight, but keeping the angle and being very careful There we are, like so, and we'll do the same for this one. So now we have three wall sections. We have a wall section which can go on each base, maybe, and we have one in the middle which can maybe go along uh, and be attached to this floor section. So that will pull out and slot back in, and that will pull out and slot back in. It's going to be a bit of an interesting challenge this, to make it so that it doesn't get broken whenever you change it around. <laughs> um, and I'm almost certainly not going to leave it to full six inches height across the whole thing. However, it made it a lot easier just to, because uh, I didn't have to pre-measure and pre-work out. I'm sure you'll notice I fly by this in my pants quite a lot. So what I'm now going to do is work out roughly where I want this wall to come down. So uh, how much damage I want to have done to it or whatever, if I want to have any walls, any windows in it. So I'm going to get my pencil now. Um, I'll turn the camera off and I'll come back when I'm going to be cutting again next. And I'll show you what it is going to look like.
I've done some scoring, I've worked out a wall line, as you can see it goes down to nothing at this point here and then builds back up again and that's where the joins are. So what I'm now going to do is get my knife out and I'm going to cut that out very carefully. Though of course I don't have to be that careful because this is a ruined wall. There we are. I'll do that for all of them. Uh, and I'll also go around the rest and build up the rest of the walls and I'll keep these bits so that I can use them for rubble and I'll be back when I have something else to show you. There we are, I've finished gluing in all of the rough bits of wall in between and these all move out and pull out quite nice and easily without any trouble. Um, one mistake I did make, this, this, is, this one here is not quite exactly lined up how I want it to, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy enough with how that looks and it's working, going to look really nice. So we're on to the next step now, which is putting the supports between the two layers. Now I've denied about this a little bit uh, and I've thought about putting walls in, but what I've decided I'm going to do is I'm going to put columns um, because that was the original idea, that was the original reason why I did two levels is because I wanted to expand and ext extend this little video, huge video now probably, no idea how long it is yet, um, to show a different technique of making columns. So that's what I'm going to do and what I might do after that once I've got the columns in and once I'm happy with them I might then put some tumble down walls and what have you. But it's basically going to have a colonnade going all the way around the outside, that's the idea. <clears throat> and to do that I'm going to use this. This is hot cold pipe, any plumber will tell you what that is and you can get it from any good stockist, even here in Bulgaria during the corona panic, I've been able to get hold of it. And I'm going to cut this into lengths of about 12 centimetres each and what I've got is this tool here which looks pretty primeval but is actually a pipe cutter. And again I made a few mistakes and actually did them off camera, which I know is particularly shocking while I was trying to cut this without making it look rubbish. But trust me, you want the right tools for this because otherwise you will not get a straight cut. So if we're going to do these 12 centimeters, what we're going to do is do it right. There we go, what we're going to do is like that. So we'll have the cutting edge. I can see through to the mark, get that nice and 90 degrees. And it's actually a ratchet cutter, you see. I won't do all these on camera, but I'll just show you that this is, this is really what you want when you're cutting this pipe. So you just put pressure on. And it cuts it. And trust me, it's hard without the right tool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a number of them. I haven't yet worked out exactly how many. Probably one, two, three, four, seven, ten, thirteen, sixteen. Sounds about right. Four aside, but two on each corner. Uh, I'll probably cut 16 lengths of that, and then I will come back when I've done that and show you gluing them on. I think I'm going to glue them to the bottom and then have something for it to slot into coming out of the, of the, uh, of the top bit so that it will sit pretty much like that. And I will show you how we'll go about getting this um, te the texture of bricks and etc. on something so smooth. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my job. I'm going to get that done and I'll see you in a bit. I've cut 16 of these at 12 centimetres each, which is what I want. What I'm now going to do is start marking up their positions. So I want them to be centred about 15 million from the edge. So they'll be very close to the edge but that will look really nice as they're spaced along here. So centred about 15 mil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark 15 mil here. I'm going to just draw a mark here and a mark here at 15 mil. And I'm also going to draw a mark here at 15 mil. And that will give me the centre of the outside column. And I'll go around and do all of that. And then I'll be back in a second to show you how I'm going to identify where the middle ones go. So I'm going to put a cross in each corner, one and a half mil in from each edge, which will be where the centre will go. I'll be back in a second. I've marked that in on each, corner, each of the corners, so we have our corner pieces. And now we're going to measure that which is 23 centimetres between each centre. 
and I'm going to divide that by three because you want to have three lengths but only two more crosses and it's basically just over seven and a half centimeters so we're going to do seven and a half there and we'll do seven and a half which will be 160 155 there okay so that is where the other centers are going to be so I will go around and mark those on the other end, other sides as well. I might just get a sharpie because it's a little bit difficult for me to see exactly where the centre is. And that is a far more obvious mark. So I'll be back in a second when I've done that and we'll look at gluing them in. It's a bit later on. I've had a busy day. But I'm back to the hobby just briefly before bed. And what I'm going to do just for this evening is get these columns stuck in which I cut earlier in the day. So how I'm going to do that is twofold. First of all I'm going to make use of this drill bit here to cut or to drill a little divot at each of the points where I would like to have the, um, the column and then I'm going to put this dowel in and I'm going to glue those in place using um, PVA I think. Um, then when that's dried, which or when that's done, then what I'll do is I'll use, I'll put a rim of gator glue around the edge and drop that in place. And that will act as a kind of little bit of a security and also make sure that it doesn't fall over in the night. <laughs> so I'm going to get that done. I'll be back later to show you it completed. Um, I'm pretty pleased with how this is going now. I was worried for a while I was going to miss my target, but I think now I should get this done. So hopefully I'm not spoken too soon. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's get cracking. That's done. And as you can see, I've set the um, other, the top on top. <laughs> as it were, and now it's time for me to just quickly straighten a couple of them and then leave well alone and leave it to dry overnight. Now, of course, it wouldn't actually take all night for it to go off, however, I do want to leave it that long. Now, there is going to be some overspill, as you can see, some, or you probably, maybe you can't, but some of the gator glue has spilled out a bit, which is a shame, but I can always tidy that up and I will be scenicking the bottom. However, that is the colonnade. Uh, what I might do is quickly adjust the camera now, just to, so you can look through. So uh, just give me one second. There you are, I've dropped the camera down, so now you can see through the building. I think it's going to look really nicely, especially when I finish scenicing it. So I'll leave that to go off overnight, and we'll be back tomorrow to do the next steps, which will be the actual adding the textures, and we'll be actually going back to the magazine as well. So how about that? It's been left overnight. And it's dried okay, as you can see. Some of them are a little bit less secure, but I will be doing detritus and other things around the bases uh, to make them more secure, but that's good. And what that means is I can set that on top. I'm actually just gonna leave it to rest on top. I don't think I need to, at this stage at least in the build, to worry about uh, adding anything underneath. My idea initially was maybe to put in each corner um, the another dowel which can sit down in there just to make it a little bit more uh, more secure and I may do that but I'm not going to do that now. What I'm going to work on now is that detritus that I just talked about and also steps. So we have our gap in the middle of this board here which is where the miniatures will be able to access the upper level and what I'm going to do is build stairs that's going to come from quite near and they're just going to rise up quite steeply. It's not going to be a shallow stairway um, and that'll give access to the uh, to the top. So that's going to be done using blue foam. Um, what I will do is I will basically measure out and cut each of these of the sections for how how high I need it to go, which is 12 centimeters, as we know. And um, then I will bring you back once I've got that planned out and show you how what it's done, how it looks, and also make a start on adding the detritus as I glue the stairs in. So I'll get that done now, and I'll be back very shortly. I've decided to leave the steps in the center for now and do a couple of the other processes that I need to do for this build. <clears throat> First one is how I'm going to make these pipes look like they're made of stones. And it's a really simple technique inspired by Battle Games in Middle Earth and their love for masking tape. And then what I'm doing is I'm winding strips of masking tape around, as you can see, leaving a little gap. And when that's painted up and dry brushed and textured, it will look like stone blocks that are cut in columns. Now what I should have done, 
hindsight being perfect. He's done this before I stuck these onto the uh, into place because this now is going to be a little bit awkward, especially because the masking tape I've got is a bit old and not all that sticky, and so I'm actually having to be quite careful when I'm using it. So this is going to be a bit fiddly, um, so I'm probably not going to do it all on camera, uh, but I will try and get the first one done if I can. I'm just going to need to grab myself my scissors. Okay, so I've got my scissors, and what I'll be doing is I'll be cutting a length and winding it round, and if I need to have more, then I can cut some more because obviously I'm not going to be able to get the whole roll of tape in there fine. So yes, I'm going to need to do some more. And like I say, this masking tape I've got is not perfectly sticky. So I'm having to throw quite a lot of it away as I'm working, which is a bit annoying. But yeah, all you're looking at doing is building up a profile on each one of these of that will then allow you to texture and make it look like stone. It doesn't need to be massively tidy, um, but I'm doing this now before I do the next step because the next step is going to be applying a covering or painting and texturing of the base. So I want this, I want these columns to look like they're actually embedded in the ground. If you think about it, this is the ground floor. The other step I'm going to do once I've done this is I'm going to carve a couple of little steps in so that you can climb up into the building, up into the watchtower from ground level because this is obviously quite proud of the ground. So there we are. Wrap that round, making sure to leave the nice gap that we want. Cool, right, I'm going to get on with the rest of this. I might be some time. And uh, I'll be back later with the next step. Progress is ongoing on this, which is okay. What I'm now about to do is just seal the foam that is on this base, because I'd like to use some spray paints and what have you, um, and that obviously is going to cause a problem potentially with the foam. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have some black paint, terrain paint that I've made, which is mixed with PVA, and I have my number one builder sand, my uh, sifted sand. And what I'm going to do is paint the black paint all over the, black, the, the base and then sprinkle some sand on just to give it a little bit more rigidity. Now this is a pre-layer before I start actually dressing any of the rest of the build. So putting any uh, rocks or anything down. This is just a, a ceiling layer um, and I'm going to paint all around the edges as well. Um, and then just sprinkle sand on just to give it a little bit of a little bit of, of, of strength, but not too much sand. It's just going to be to add a little bit of um, texture to it, etc. So I'll get that done. Uh, I'll do a section so you can see if you've not watched one of my videos before, you've not seen how I do this. Um, you paint a bit of an area, don't paint too much. Though on foam you can probably paint more, but if you're doing it on modeling compound or anything like that, which will dry, um, soak up moisture quickly, then you don't do a large section. But when you paint going straight onto foam like this, you can do quite a lot because it doesn't dry that quickly. Um, so we'll do a little bit more. So yeah, just dump the, dump the paint in. And once you've done enough of a section, we'll get this step done and then stop. What I should say is yesterday evening or so I went round and uh, I was actually on a Zoom call for my mate's birthday and I was wrapping these pipes in the masking tape while I was on the call, which was very much fun. So yeah, so we're going to paint that on, like that, and then you get your sand which has been sifted to be nice and fine and you carefully scatter it on. Just like that. And that will soak up the paint, dry on, give it a little bit of texture and a little bit of strength. And mean that hopefully this board doesn't get damaged when it's used. 
so there we are and it does dry quick once the sand's on it so once you've got a good covering you can pretty much empty that straight back into your bucket and carry on with the next step there we are so we can pretty much immediately pick that up and drop the sand off any loose sand and move on so I'll do all of this base like that and I'll be back with the next step when I come to it. For the first time for a while, we're back to the magazine and we're on step six, which is what I've been working towards. So texture and detail. Before you texture the ruined archway, you can add brickwork as you did for the Rohan house and beacon in packs nine and 10, which I am gonna do. You might also like to glue sm small pieces of corrugated card to the sides of the column to represent ruined sidewalls, which I haven't done. What I've done here is I've used blue foam, as you can see, to do that, and I've done some tangle with some fallen down ones and bricks and what have you, so that's how I've done that. Um, once the glue on the brickwood is dried, cover the walls and column with a thin layer of plaster filler, stippling it where necessary to create a rough texture. Do not paint the filler on too thickly, or you might obscure the details you have added. So we're going to get that done. So what I'm going to do is quickly show you how I've made my card uh, bricks, because I figured that might be of interest to you. So all I've done is I've got the back of a drawing pad. This is a WH Smith squared pad and cut those into uh, lengths on the, on the back using a knife and my safety ruler and then cut those strips up into tiny little brick shaped squares and I have quite a few of them I've got a load in this box here which is where I keep them um, and I've got some more here which is what I'm about to do so I'm going to get myself all set up and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some of these bricks to this part of the column I'm not going to put them on here and I'm not going to put them on here I'm just going to glue them on around to the actual archway area so i'll get that done and when it's when it's finished uh, and i'm ready to do the next step i will i'll invite you back next step on this part of the build is to score in the i want this to be like blocks and it's going to be blocks that are over stone so what i'll be doing is i will be that would have been clad so I will be sticking on some other of this material on the sides to, uh, to simulate that. I'll show you a little bit of this and then I'm going to get on with the rest of it off camera because it's going to be quite boring. But I have a, pencil, a pen here, a big pen, that I have um, wrapped masking tape around the end so that it's a bit stronger because it did start breaking. And all I'll be doing is scoring in some bricks or some slabs. Now... I am going to do it relatively evenly, if I can, can, but not totally. So I'm not going to have the, um, a ruler out to make sure everything is the right shape or size, but just near enough. And I'll be rounding off the corners like so to make it so that they're a little more natural looking slabs. Um, but yeah, so I'll be doing that for the entirety of this, of this board, of this area, just like that. Very simple technique, but it will look absolutely great when it's painted up and finished. This is by far not, not the final step. So yeah, I'll get that done and I'll be back to show what it looks like when it's finished. Okay, so those are now dried on, those cards, cardboard cutouts. I've also done the um, stones for the top of that and the base has been sprayed black. So now I'm going to do the next step of the texture and detail, which is uh, painting on plaster filler. I've got polyfiller here, which is what I'm going to use. Um, and so I'm going to paint that over all of these and all of these columns. Now I know that I've um, undercoated these black already, but that's because I wanted to get a better adherence on the pipe, because um, yeah, I'm a bit worried about how that would work. Um, and I'm also going to put the filler onto these walls. Um, so there's a lot of fillering to do. Um, I'll do this one first, a brand new virgin pot of polyfiller. Um, so we'll just get that. And I've got a rough brush, which is an old brush, very stiff brush, which I don't use very often. But it's good for this because I don't care, it's not going to last anyway. So yeah, and we're just going to paint that all over everything. Now, if you find that your polyfiller is a little bit thick then you can scoop it out put some water onto a palette which i might have to do looking at this 
um, and that will make it spread a bit easier. But basically, this is what you're doing. You're just painting it over. Simple as that, to give a little bit of texture. Um, I'm going to paint it on the base as well because I'm not going to do sand on, on grass on these. These are on top of a building, as you've seen. So yeah, I'm going to get that done. Put some music on for myself. Turn the camera off for you because you really don't want to see me doing this for the next 40 minutes or so, or however long it's going to take me. Um, and I'll be back when it comes to the next step, which is detailing the base, which won't take very long. But I'll be back very shortly for you and in quite a long time for me. Okay, now we're on to step seven, which is detailing the base. Put a thick layer of PVA glue on the base, concentrating on the areas around the bottom of the arch. Onto this, pour some sprue rubble. I have just spent a very long time cutting up a lot of sprue. Before the glue dries, sprinkle modelling sand over it and again tap off the excess. This can get very messy, so make sure you've got newspaper down um, before you bring, begin pouring sand and sprue rubble. So, I'm going to get stuck into that now. I obviously have quite a lot of it to do. I have the five arches to do, but I also have to put some on this base here, which is the base that the arches are going to sit on. And I'm also going to sprinkle some rubble and what have you around the bases of these columns. So I won't do all of that on camera, obviously, because that would just become very tedious. But what I will do in, enough to sh for you to see on one of the, or two of these um, of these actual arches. So I have my PVA glue to hand, which I will now pour out onto here. I have my sprue rubble, and I have two grades of builder's sand. I have both number two and number three, so that I can do a nice mix of textures onto these bases. Now I'm not going to be putting any flock or very much flock on these uh, models because they're going to sit on that base. There will be some growth and some greenery which will be there to represent a uh, little bit of, of, um, of growth that's grown up but it's designed to look like it's actually sitting on rock. Now I probably in hindsight should have not done this on cardboard and done it on the same foam as I've made the top of the actual tower and then I could have um, could have drawn on the the uh, slabs or what have you but it is what it is little mistake it won't annoy me too much and I can make it look quite nice so anyway here we are lots of PVA with a whole load of PVA on there now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my sprue rubble here and I'm just going to sprinkle it on and I'm not really going to worry too much about what I'm picking out because it is all going to get painted and there'll be sand put on and what have you. So we're just going to pile a load of sprue rubble on like so. Okay, so there we are. Maybe we're a bit back here. There's some sprue rubble. So what we're now going to do is get the number three builder sand, which is the larger one. And I'm going to use a spoon for this. And I'm going to get a spoonful of that and actually do this over, so this is not going to be very much in shot, but do this over the top of the bucket so it doesn't spill as much. There we are. Good. And then we're going to do the same, and this is completely out of shot because I'm rubbish. Do the same with the number two. And there you are, you can see that, that has lots and lots of rubble and stuff around it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do roughly the same thing for every single um, of, the, of these arches and then the rest of, those, of the buildings that I've shown you. So I'll get that done and I'll be back for the next step shortly. As you'll have noticed, I've gone off the idea of having uh, solid steps going up and while I might decide to add some fallen rubble a little higher around the centre, which obviously I haven't yet, what I'm going to do is make some simple um, ladder, wooden ladder, which can be propped up to allow access between the two levels. So the way I'm going to do this is to chopstick skewers that came with a sushi set that Angela had and whenever she has one I get the chopsticks <laughs> and I'm going to use these matchsticks that I bought which don't have any light on it they're actually from a hobby shop 
so we don't have to bother. Um, oh, that's hard to take out at the moment. <clears throat> don't have to bother cutting off the ends. And I've made a very, very simple um, guide here out of Lego that you can see that's just the idea is to keep these two skewers at roughly the right distance apart. And what I'm going to do <clears throat> is something I don't normally do. I'm going to use super glue. I don't normally use it for, for gluing wood, but I want this to go off quickly. Certainly this first one I want to go off very quickly. So I'm just going to put a little dab of super glue on, and before it falls off, drop it in place. There we are. And now what I can do, because I've got the Lego there, I can shift these a little bit in, and I'm going to be doing it with double steps. So it'll be two, um, two matchsticks per row. There we are. So that's the first one in. Um, so I'll do the next one now. So very carefully, a bit more carefully than I did last time. I'm not going to put too many rungs on because the idea is, is that potentially I can actually wedge a miniature um, base and actually stand the miniature up on the rungs. So I don't want to be too close together. There we are. Okay, so I'm going to go down and do that all the way and then I'll be back to show you, I'm having thoughts about maybe another step after this one, but I'll be back to show you what it looks like when it's done anyway. That took almost no time because of this stuff, which is awesome when you're working with super glue and you don't want to wait. So now I have a little ladder, which is going to allow access between the two layers. I will probably stain that um, and I might put some, um, wrap, wrap some cord around each of these. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm still deciding on that. Um, but yeah, I might put some might put some cord so it looks like it's tied. Um, but yeah, that's that's good enough for now. At least there's some way of getting between one floor and the next, and I think it looks quite nice. I finished all that, left it to dry overnight, and that is now ready for painting, which is actually step eight: paint or spray the entire model with a black undercoat. Once this has dried thoroughly, apply a heavy dry brush of dark grey to the entire model with an old, large old brush. Apply a second lighter dry brush of pale grey as a highlight. Any exposed parts of the base have not been covered with sand can be touched up with green paint once the green sections are dry. Apply PVA glue to these areas and cover them with static grass to finish off the base as usual. So I'm about to go down now and spray this black because um, I want to get it done quickly and that's the quickest way to do it. Um, once that's dry, I will do the dry brushing and I will involve you in that, but I'll basically just be using car primer. But I'm really pleased with how it's worked actually. That top has look is gonna look absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, and I'm pleased with the whole, whole build at the moment. So yeah, I'm gonna go and do that now and I will bring you back in when I come to the dry brushing. Took two sprays to get this to a place where I was happy with it, but boy, am I happy with it. This is looking absolutely incredible. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get the two grays that I normally use for my dry brushing stages, and I will do one of these arches on camera for you, and then I will do the rest of it off camera because it will take me quite a while. So yeah, I'll get myself set up, but I wanted to quickly show you what it looked like at this stage because yeah, it's really, really coming on very nicely. Okay, so you've seen me do this before, but I'll do this again just for this one. I have two different greys. I have a dark one, which is in this pot, and I have the lighter one, which is in this pot. So first of all, I will do the heavy overbrush, which is not so much a dry brush at all, as you can see, but is um, looking at blocking in the colour, because we want this to be grey stone, according to the instructions, and I'm happy enough to do that. So yeah, so that's quite a heavy brush. Uh, you're not you're not pulling the paint off as much as you are for a dry brush. Um, you may be not pressing very hard when you're actually doing the paint, um, which is how you're more uh, more how you're controlling the fact that you want to leave some of the deeper recesses completely black. So yes, we'll get that done. I'll pop some music on. Okay, there we are. So it makes a big difference already, as you can see. It's not um, it's not a small difference when you when you do the first overbrush. Let me just get a little bit more light on that. Um, there we are. 
So what I'll do is I'll do the rest of the model um, with this colour and then I'll come back for the next stage when I get to it. Right now I'm just going to stain this under. I don't have any of the materials that I wanted to to do the advanced kind of binding stuff so I might find some, I just need a paper clip and then well, I might do it in a different build video. I was thinking about just bending some paper clips over the joints to make it a little more secure and also give some kind of rationale between how it's secured in by the people that made it in miniature. But yeah, never mind. So this is the mahogany stain. It's actual real wood stain, which is what I use. Um, it's designed to go on your on your eaves outside, so it's got a ceiling and preservative properties as well. Um, and it's the best thing I've found for staining wood funnily enough is wood stain. So we'll get that done and I'll do this side and then when it's dry I'll turn it over and I'll do the other and then that will be ready and done. That was a very quick little project. Um, I think it looks really nice. I'm really pleased with that actually. Um, it's better than the uh, than the steps that I was trying and failing to do which just didn't look right at all. Couldn't get the uh, couldn't, couldn't get them to look right so give up on it. It's not what this build's about anyway but this will give at least give access up the to the top level at some point when it's played when it's played with which hopefully won't be too long. Might be nice to actually get a game at some point. It's been ages since I've played anything at all. Been busy on other things. Anyway, now I'm muttering. I'll stop muttering. I'll leave that dry and I'll do the other side when it's done. A little later on in the day, I had a really lovely afternoon. <laughs> so I stopped hobbying, which was nice. And what I'm now about to do is the lighter grey and an actual dry brush. So again, I will do it on one of these arches and then apply it to the whole of the rest of the model. Uh, and what I will also be doing is after this dry brush, which is going to be a very light one, as I've said, is actually painting the bricks and picking out some details solidly. So this is really not going to look like it's going to do much, but it will bring out some more of the detail and it will be very, very quick. And what I might do is come back in with some white as well. But I always say that and I never bother. But I might do in this case. We shall see. So yeah, that's all there is going to be to it. Just make that highlight so you can, I don't know if you can see the difference, it's not a huge difference. But I'll be doing that to all of these arches and then to the rest of the model as well, which is looking beautiful by the way. I'm very, very pleased with this. This has really come together. It's been a bit of a rush at the end because I've been quite behind for various reasons. Mostly because I didn't know what I was going to do and therefore I didn't start the advanced part of the build till quite late in the in the two weeks I, I give myself and that's when it's been a bit of a hurry but I think it's pretty cool I think it's come out very nicely indeed so I'll get the rest of these done stop waffling now and I'll be back when I do the final stage which will be detailing this really is approaching completion now and I'm really pleased with how it looks I could leave it like this, it would be perfectly happy to leave it like this, but I feel that it needs just a couple of splashes of colour, just something to bring it to life a little bit. So what I'm going to be doing, and I'm looking at it now, I'm not, I'm not going to throw glue at it and throw flock on it or anything like that, I'm just looking at it and going to make some decisions. I might put some wood, and, some wood um, so that look a bit like this and just glue that in place so that it looks like fallen rafters or something like that. That will be quite a nice contrast, the, the brown against the grey. And what I might also do is put some trailing um, plants down some of these columns and maybe even down some of these columns. I'm not going to do too much, I just want it to be very subtle. So what I'm going to do now is stare at it, look at it, and I'll bring you back when I'm about to actually put the things on that I decided. And then, and then the project is done on time and I've managed it. First of all, wood then. So what I've done is I've pulled out my scraps of coffee stirrers that I saved and sections of uh, matchsticks and toothpicks. 
that I also save, so I throw very little away. And I've just worked out roughly where I want things to be, and then I've stained most of them with the same mahogany colour as I used for the stairs, or for the steps ladder. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to glue them in place. So I have some PVA, and I will glue them roughly where, um, where I positioned them. I don't want it to be overloaded, like I've said. I don't want it to dominate, but I do like the idea of just little flashes of colour, just making it a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to whoa, going to break it. Fortunately, not break it because it's quite tough, but uh, going to be clumsy. Um, I'm going to go around now and stick these in place where I think I want them, and I'll bring you back in when that's done and when I'm about to position the greenery, which I want to do. Greenery. Several years back, I bought a bit of this. It was around Easter time and they had it in the shops very cheap. I think it was probably just after Easter, so they were selling it off. So I bought several packets. And as you can see from how full that bucket is, I've not really used it, but it is really cool. Let me zoom in a little bit and you'll see I have placed some on already, just as a splash of color just in front of the model here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this again sparsely around on the top and as I've said already, down these columns. So I'll zoom back out again a little bit more so you can see the entire model. And I'm just gonna be using PVA glue. So this is the first place I want to put it. And again, sparse is the key. I don't wanna overwhelm this with greenery. It's supposed to be a um, built up ruin. And so it really shouldn't be covered in growing things. This will probably take a little bit of time for me to actually do, so I'll probably only glue this first one in and then come back at the end when it's dried and show you what I've done across the board. But it glues down quite nicely with PVA. It's very, very delicate, which is one of the issues I had with it. When I first started using it, I wasn't confident enough really in my skills. But with a delicate application, you can glue that in place. When that's dried on the top, I will then glue this so that it's going down over the edge. But for now, I'm going to leave it. There's no rush. And I'm going to work around the rest of the model with more of this, this stuff, whatever it's called, this green greenery, and uh, just dress it up again. No more so really than I've done for the wood, just in the small places, uh, just to bring highlights out. And I think that is going to be the final step. So when I've done that, we'll wrap this video up. So I've done gluing and now I'm waiting for it to dry. And you can see I've not put very much on, but just enough just to kind of bring some highlights out. That's the final process I'm gonna do on this build. It's been a lot of fun. It's taken me a lot longer than I wanted it to, mainly as um, I would say, because I wasn't sure about what to do for the advanced build. But I'm really pleased with how that's looking and I'll get some proper photographs to put at the end of the video. But now I'll move the camera around and we'll sign this off. So there we are, that was a really fun build. It was very quick to do the build that was in the magazine, just those little arches and what have you. Probably took me no more than a day, even with the limited time I've got at the moment. It was the advanced thing that has meant that this is now Sunday afternoon when I'm filming this before the Tuesday, so I need to get straight onto editing. And mainly because I wasn't totally sure what to do. I didn't come into this with very much of an idea, and that probably isn't very good when you're on a time scale like this. However, what has happened is something pretty cool. It's going to be good fun to play on. It's going to look amazing on the board, on the tabletop. And it's given me some opportunity to try some different techniques out. So using the plumbing pipe, that's worked very well. I'm not sure that I will continue using uh, masking tape. I should probably have used the plumber's tape, which is more likely to stick well. And then with the black undercoat, obviously it will then uh, paint up fine once it's been primed. Probably also should have done them before I'd stuck them down to the baseboard, but these are all lessons to learn and now I've made those mistakes, you don't have to. So I hope that's been useful and you've enjoyed and learned a lot from watching this. I'll sign off now and thank you for watching Beard Clipper. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, ding the bell so that you're told whenever one of these videos goes live. And please stay safe and stay healthy and keep hobbying and I'll see you next time.